So as a genius and a unique creative mind, Goethe, so literary and cultural history wants it, was not influenced by others. Goethe is even von geringeren nicht beeinflusst worden. That's Dieter Lamping speaking. Scholarship has always been highly protective of Goethe when it comes to safeguarding his originality. Manifests an anxiety of influence that stands in the way of understanding how Goethe's text did profit from and actively participate in, for instance, a re-evaluation of the body that took place in medical and pedagogical di discourses of his time. To some extent, Goethe's interest in the natural sciences uh, seems to be an exception to this trend. Generally, his connections with the scientific minds of his uh, age are well documented, primarily, I would argue, because they contribute to the scientific prestige of the author himself. Goethe's relationship with the, in his day, well-known and respected Göttingen medical scholar and natural historian and anthropologist, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach uh, fits this model. Meetings between Goethe and Blumenbach have been documented fairly well. They met uh, during a visit by Blumenbach to Weimar on April 30th and the 1st and 2nd of May, 1783, relatively soon after Goethe would discover the intermaxillary bone. Interesting. Uh, after that first meeting in 18, 1783, then their relationship intensified. They met again in Weimar, 1796, in Göttingen, 1801, in Jena, 1820, and then in 1822 in Weimar, and they exchanged letters somewhat frequently until 1829. The broader issue at stake when we look at Blumenbach's importance or relevance for Goethe is the question how Blumenbach's ideas about natural history and his anthropological and biological thinking translate into a vision of human life. Without a doubt, Blumenbach is one of the main sources of Goethe's anthropological thinking and also the norms and values associated with it. I think nowadays the importance of Blumenbach's concepts of Bildung and the Bildungstrieb for Goethe uh, on the one hand appears to have become common knowledge about Goethe, we are aware uh, of, of that link, and yet on the other hand this nexus is interestingly very little studied. This goes in particular also for the link between natural history and the two Wilhelm Meister novels that I'll discuss a bit later. Part of the problem may be that philological means alone do not get us very far in mapping out the relationship between Goethe and Blumenbach. While Goethe occasionally commented on Blumenbach's works, so I'll show below, those comments do not really suffice to map out how Blumenbach enabled Goethe to formulate a theory of Bildung. Another difficulty is that a comprehensive holistic study of Blumenbach's work, in particular the logic underlying that work and the connections to his contemporaries to date has still remained a desideratum, in spite of the fact that scholars in recent years have pointed to the centrality of Blumenbach to 18th century anthropology, natural history and biology, and I'm thinking then, uh, for instance, of the earlier volume by Lauer and uh, Rupke, but also uh, of a scholar like John Samito in his gestation of biology, which actually does kind of map out nicely how central Blumenbach was to a number of these uh, debates. Um, I'm not convinced, and here I break kind of with a certain school within Goethe scholarship, I'm not convinced that Bildung is primarily either an educational uh, or aesthetic concept in Goethe's work. Um, for the purpose of this paper, at least I'll argue that the educational and aesthetic dimensions of the term are secondary in comparison to its primary meaning, meaning that it's clearly rooted in natural history and its offshoot, enlightenment, and topology. Bildung is rather an example, I would argue, of what Mika Bal has termed a traveling concept. A concept at home in one discipline, natural history, that Goethe seeks to apply to another discipline, literature, uh, with the practical effect that through its new use and a new context, it's also redefined. 
And that's, of course, a phenomenon we're very familiar with uh, in relation to Wahlverwandtschaften. Huh? Uh, so my argument would be that in, in the case of the Villa Meister novel, something similar uh, is going on. Um, the Bildungstrieb is not a standalone concept in, uh, in Blumenbach's work, as, my, uh, as, as, as the previous speaker has also very clearly shown, of course. Um, it's, it's part of his epigenetic uh, view of the origins and the uh, development of life uh, that acknowledges that procreation and growth of life forms include the addition of new elements. Interestingly, Blumenbach's epigenetic theory also takes into consideration environment, climate and geography, as contemporaries would have it, under the influence of Buffon, uh, and how humans adapt to that uh, environment. Goethe acknowledges the ex epigenetic aspect of Blumenbach's theory of building explicitly in one of the few statements on the natural historian. He also recognized that the concept presented a kind of epistemological departure from older models. Instead of a mechanical or chemical process, it relied on the organism and its functioning as central for the understanding of nature. Environment is an important concept with which Goethe himself works as well. For instance, in his morphological studies. And this is one of the uh, quotes on the handout, I'll only read the beginning. Der Fisch ist für das Wasser da, scheint mir viel weniger zu sagen, als der Fisch ist in dem Wasser und durch das Wasser da. An environmental kind of explanation what a fish is. Bildung, whether we interpret it as a process or a final form, is unthinkable without taking into account the material circumstances in which a living being exists. One can see the final shape, the gestalt of a being, as the product of the interaction of an inner core, can uh, with external circumstances. I wanted to kind of like remind people that Blumenbach was a radical thinker at the time. Epistemologically, he is in line with Buffon, and he was critical of any form of teleological thinking. His work articulates what you, Barr, Nisbet has termed an anti-teleological attitude that can also be found in Herder and Goethe. I think that characterization, an anti-teleological attitude, is a very well-chosen one, uh, because these three thinkers indeed conceived of nature's development as fundamentally open in line with the consequent temporalization of nature based on the dependence of different beings on their surrounding environment had been promoted by Buffon in his Histoire Naturelle. Yet it's also hard to think, of course, of developmental patterns without assuming some kind of direction. How is it possible to think of development that is open and yet also somehow directed, uh, hence that anti-teleological attitude. Nisbet doesn't speak of anti-teleology, but of a kind of an attitude, basically, a principle that's at work there, but that might not be entirely successful. Um, taking Blumenbach's theory into consideration when reading Goethe allows us some insight into the complex, to some extent also contradictory nature of Goethe's thinking on nature. The dynamic aspect of Blumenbach's concept of Bildung makes it impossible to take to think of Bildung as the realization of some kind of essence already present in a human being. That would be preformation. I would argue though that in a lot of the scholarship that approaches the educational or aesthetic kind of like aspects of Bildung would precisely do that. Huh? Um, but by taking environmental factors into consideration, it forces us to take into account elements of randomness or chaos as constitutive for the development of biological forms. Furthermore, to use biological terminology as a means to understand complex social organizations uh, is, however, not unproblematic, as I will show 
later on as well. Instead, instead of conceiving of the Bildungstrie as a concept that is normative in the sense of a developmental ideal that his Wilhelm Meister novels are meant to illustrate, I propose to understand the concept in line with Blumenbach's ideas epistemologically as primarily a descriptive tool that Goethe seeks to develop and try out through writing his Wilhelm Meister novels by simultaneously interrogating its descriptive, descriptive usefulness and normative implications. Goethe alludes to this epistemological function of Blumenbach's epigenetic theory, which the Bildungstrieb is an important exponent, in quoting Kant's Kritik der Urteils uh, Kraft. Kant sees epigenesis as a preferred Erklärungsart, uh, at the same time emphasizes also that we're dealing with a uns unerforschliches Prinzip, of which the function is unbestimmbar, or quotes from Kant that Goethe in turn quotes himself. A regulative idea that is part of Kant's transcendental philosophy, the Bildungstrieb, and not necessarily of empirical reality. Uh, we can hypothesize about it, but we cannot define it or determine it exactly. Um, the Bildungstrieb and Bildung more generally then are concepts in construction in Blumenbach's works themselves. The same is the case in Wilhelm Meister's novels uh, as well. And I think as the previous speaker has shown as well, uh, kind of like Blumenbach is able to kind of change his, change his mind about uh, things. Huh? Um, über den Bildungstrieb und das Zeugungsgeschäfte, Blumenbach first and foremost asks, how we are to understand the formative force called Bildungstrieb and how we can prove its existence in nature. He develops this idea as an alternative to the uh, preformationist or evolutionary accounts of procreation that assume that all human beings' traits and potential are already contained in the germs present at conception. Uh, with his theory, Blumenbach questions the basic premises of pre-formationist thinking. Um, speculations about what happens during and after procreation constitute a first line of argumentation in Blumenbach's uh, Bildungstrieb essay. Huh? It's an interesting to look at this essay also as a statement about sexuality uh, in a time in which there are not in which these, these, these uh, biological theories uh, about procreation are still very much in flux as well. The act of procreation for the first time manifests and sets in motion a force um, that will be active throughout a biological entity's lifespan to shape, preserve, and if necessary, restore its uh, form. Um, then with that, the act of procreation the Zeugungsgeschäft, the matter, business, transaction of procreation becomes a privileged, ma privileged manifestation of the Bildungstrie. Blumenbach bases his claims, however, on other observations in nature, and that is his second line of argumentation. This essay starts out with uh, the Anlass to dieser Untersuchung, um, observations of the behavior of the green, many armed water polyp in the mill point, Pond that didn't base is able to replace parts um, that, uh, that are cut off, observations that then lead him to positing the existence of a formative drive. The third line of argumentation in Blumenbach's essay concerns then examples of development gone wrong, monstrosities, misgeburten, monstrositäten, hybrids, bastarde. Um, on the one hand, he sees those as negative and characterizes them as Abweichungen. Uh, on the other hand, he's also intrigued by the similarity of such irregularities. And that kind of then, in his view, points to the ability, of the formative drive to produce Spielarten, Varietäten, um, and climate, nutrition, and ways of living uh, plays a role in this development of these Varietäten. Blumenbach says then in a clear kind of reference to Buffon's Histoire, Natural. Part kind of of this theory of epigenesis 
is an interaction between internal drive and external stimuli, as Blumenbach himself then states uh, in a later clarification of his ideas in the fifth edition of his Handbuch der uh, Naturgeschichte um, on your quote uh, sheet on my hand out as well. And this statement stays then in there uh, from 1792 until kind of the very last edition, but you cannot find it in this form in earlier editions. We know that Goethe read Johann Friedrich Blumenbach's Über den Bildungstrieb und das Zeugungsgeschäfte several times. Goethe himself uses the term Bildungstrieb on occasion throughout his work from the mid 1780s on. In two essays, he explicitly discusses the term and its epistemological merits. The publication dates of these essays are very interesting, 1795 and 1820, because they immediately precede the publication of the Lehrjahre, 1795, 1796, and the first edition of the Wanderjahre, 1821. Even though at first sight, the essays occupy themselves with topics that have very little to do with Goethe's literary ambitions. You just feel the need to think about Bildung right around the time he's conceptualizing and writing these novels. It's also interesting that Goethe and Blumenbach, as I mentioned earlier, met in 1796 and 1820. So around the time these essays are being published and these major literary projects take place. Um, that is also close then to the publication date of the Lyria and the Wanderjahr. Goethe's first essay uh, in which he engages with Blumenbach, Erster Entwurf, an Allgemeine Einleitung in die Vergleichende Anatomie, ausgehend von der Osteologie, dated Jena, Jan uh, January 1795, uh, contains a segment explicitly addressing the uh, Bildungstrieb. It's the function of the Bildungstrieb to govern the relationship between type, typus, uh, and individual. Thus, uh, Besondere. Goethe too notes that it's the environment that shapes an animal's functionality. Das Tier wird durch Umstände zu Umständen gebildet, daher seine innere Vollkommenheit und seine Zweckmäßigkeit nach außen. Goethe here very much also aims for a dynamic conceptualization of the formative drive to. Um, uh, or the Bildungstrieb. Um, second text that discusses Blumenbach is Goethe's essay, Bildungstrieb, first published in 1820, most likely, however, written in 1817. Goethe motivates his interest in the concept of Bildungstrieb most clearly in this latter essay. He is intrigued by the concept because it allows for a theory that incorporates materialism but does not reduce nature to the realm of the material, rather than a mechanical explanation that is based in what is material, materie, only. Goethe in line with Blumenbach here proposes a force that's organic in nature. It's important to recognize that this force, Kraft, Trieb, Tätigkeit, is inherent to this organic matter. Um, and uh, in the paragraph that follows this kind of observation, he writes that, the material that's for and act activity, tätigkeit are to be taught as intrinsically connected. So it's not kind of, it's uh, uh, the two of them actually kind of like form uh, uh, a link together that, that is more than the uh, sum of its parts. So that kind of like are intertwined in such a way that they cannot be separated anymore. Blumenbach's theory of Bildung offers go to a mode of understanding and describing humans as organisms. If you then kind of see how this concept travels from natural history to literature, uh, it's important that this term Bildung is not necessarily used as a symbol or a metaphor to create a conceptual equivalent of how humans function, but it actually describes their functioning. In both Blumenlachs and Goethe's view, Bildung has kind of a strong societal uh, component uh, as well. It's not too hard to find passages in Goethe's Villa Meister, and now talking about the Lierjahre, that are reminiscent of the formative drive 
in a Blumenbachian sense. Uh, and a number of these passages folk, focus on Mignon. Uh, I'll read you a part of the first and the longer quote is on the, uh, on the handout uh, that kind of uh, documents Wilhelm encountering Mignon for the first time. Er schätzte sie 12 bis 13 Jahre. Ihr Körper war gut gebaut, nur dass ihre Glieder einen stärkeren Wuchs versprachen oder einen zurückgehaltenen ankündigten. Ihre Bildung war nicht regelmäßig, aber auffallend. He explicitly Goethe mentions not just Mignon's body, but also her Bildung. He is intrigued by Mignon's body because of its unusual shape. He reads Mignon's body as the product of time and space, very much in the sense of the model that uh, Buffon uh, uh, proposed and then Blumenbach further developed. Um, in the way her body is described, one can read its past and future. Her arms and legs show that she has either been held back in her growth and or the promise of a stronger growth. Um, what is also kind of interesting is her his commenting on the tan color of her face in combination with Mignon's feeling out of place, which is linked to climate, a kind of very important uh, factor in both Blumenbach and uh, Buffon as well. She longs to be in the South for clear climatological reasons. Uh, Gehst du nach Italien, so nimm mich mit, es friert mich hier. Another element they have in common, Blumenbach's text uh, on Bildung and uh, Goethe's uh, description of Mignon, is the matter of procreation as well. Mignon is a product of an incestuous relationship and she has no clear sex. Uh, in the Wanderjahre, she's referred to as a Knabenmädchen or an anmutige Scheinknabe. Uh, that too is a form of temporalization of her body and fits well in with Blumenbach's kind of description of uh, uh, primitive life forms uh, being uh, undefined in terms of sex characteristics and more advanced life forms uh, that have a clearer sex identity as well. Um, one should also note, I think, that Goethe's text avoids here the kind of terminology Blumenbach uses for creatures exhibiting an unusual developmental pattern, Missgeburt, Monstrosität, was that, wieder natürlich, all terms with a high normative potential, uh, Goethe instead proceeds more descriptively. The argument for a positive model of Bildung in Goethe's novel is made at least in part by contrasting positive with negative models personified by those characters whose bodies show that they have not been able to fulfill their potential. While some characters perish, Wilhelm, in contrast, learns about the regenerative powers of his own body. The young Wilhelm does not believe in the healing powers of his own body. Wie lange hielt ich mich für unzerstörbar, für unverwundlich? Und ach, nun sehe ich, dass ein tiefer, früher Schade ich wieder auswachsen, nicht wieder auswachsen, sich nicht wieder herstellen kann. Later in the text, uh, later in the text, the surgeon who treats Wilhelm after he is wounded, severely during the robbery in the woods, who is characterized as an unwissender, aber nicht ungeschickter Mensch, points Wilhelm to the healing powers of nature. Er ließ die Natur walten und so war der Patient bald auf dem Wege der Besserung. There's, there are quite a number of references to the latency of the process of Bildung, something that is also important in Blumenbach. Uh, alles, was uns begegnet, lässt Spuren zurück. Uh, alles trägt unmerklich zu unserer Bildung bei. Uh, doch es ist gefährlich, sich davon Rechenschaft geben zu wollen. We have to accept that this process happens, it says here in the Lehrjahre. Uh, we can observe them, but we can't really uh, steer them one way or another. Um, um, I'll read you one more quote, the last one. Sobald der Mensch an mannigfaltige Tätigkeit oder mannigfaltigen Genussanspruch macht, so muss er auch fähig sein, mannigfaltige 
Organe an sich gleichsam unabhängig voneinander auszubilden. That's Blumenbach to the core. Here it is being used metaphorically. The idea that kind of like in response to your environment, uh, you develop new, new uh, multiple organs uh, as an image to clarify human uh, development. Interesting then, Dila Meister's Wanderjahre doesn't exactly break with the idea of the Bildungstrieb, uh, but it certainly is critical of the normative potential of the biological and anthropological assumptions underlying the Lehrjahre. This would also clearly be a longer argument, which I won't give you here, uh, but uh, here Mignon, for instance, is also an interesting example. She undergoes a remarkable renaissance in the Wanderjahre. Uh, her memory and the places she has been uh, visited by Willem and his painter friend turn into the object of an aesthetic and almost religious uh, devotion. While uh, Mignon was out of place, she belonged to Italy, uh, was and long to be back there. We don't find that kind of like uh, link between an individual and their natural environment. In the Wanderjahre, the Wanderjahre in general promote a cosmopolitan impulse. Willem is not allowed to stay in one place longer than three days. The Pedagogische Provinz, the big project at the center of the Wanderjahre, is a small universe of world languages. Uh, Every month, a different language is being uh, spoken. Um, so these are fragments of an interpretation. I think to really, really look into the uh, implications of uh, Blumenbach's concept of building the Bildungstrieb for uh, for Goethe and for the for the Villa Meister project, uh, be a much more complex enterprise. Uh, at stake, in addition, at stake, in addition to Bildung, is also very much, I uh, would argue, his concept of uh, nature and a rethinking of nature taking place during uh, Goethe's time uh, in the sign of temporalization. I don't believe that Goethe was an uncritical reader of Blumenbach. Um, to some extent, the question of what nature and Bildung are for both Goethe and Blumenbach is uh, an open one. Blumenbach confronted Goethe with a real intellectual challenge and forced him to rethink some of his most basic uh, assumptions. Uh, to some extent, that means giving up uh, on the desire for uh, an ideal subject that can be known as normative. Uh, to instead kind of like think of subjectivity uh, as always temporal, as always in development, and to some extent also in transparent uh, to itself, and yet nevertheless also uh, developmental, uh, multidirectional, uh, and open in its, uh, its development. It's precisely this openness uh, that for me makes Goethe's text uh, interesting uh, and also makes him into an unconventional and creative thinker. Thank you very much.